society. So begging and asking for money and begging for alms could have meant something very different to people then. So context is another element that if we don't understand it from the joke, we might have to use the joke to reverse engineer what was actually going on in the past. And then all the sinking can sort of make the humor collapse. Something else that Mary Beard has focused on is we don't know what people's reaction was to jokes. Today, of course, the reaction is laughter. But we don't exactly know how ancient people laughed. How did ancient people react to laughter? Did their philosophical systems require them to not react in a certain way and reacting in a way that wasn't befitting of them could have signaled they were lower class or barbaric? Or would they laugh loudly and laugh in an uncontrollable way? There's a portion from the Roman history in which Cassius Dio and other senators are watching Emperor Commodus slay ostriches in the amphitheater. Commodus wasn't very mentally well and prone to killing whomever he wanted. And here's how the passage goes in the Roman history. This fear was shared by all, by us senators as well as by the rest. And here is another thing that he did to us senators, which gave us every reason to look for our death. Having killed an ostrich and cut off his head, Commodus came up to where we were sitting, holding the head in his left hand and in his right hand, raising aloft his bloody sword. And though he spoke not a word, yet he waggled his head with a grin, indicating that he would treat us in the same way. And many would indeed have perished by the sword on the spot for laughing at him, for it was laughter rather than indignation that overcame us. If I had not chewed some laurel leaves, which I got from my garland myself, and persuaded the others who were sitting near me to do the same, so in the steady movement of our armies, we may conceal the fact that we were laughing. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. So even though it meant certain death, Dio and the other senators had to chew laurels so as not to give in what was clearly an urge to laugh hysterically. This type of laughing wouldn't be allowed because it would consider derision or the laughing of others. And this is something that Cicero points out where he speaks of different types of humor. He notes that there's laughing at others. There's also puns or wordplay. There's incongruity, the pairing of opposites, and humor as a release from tension. And I'll let you determine what this joke is from the Philo Gelos, number 202, and it goes like this. An incompetent astrologer cast a boy's horoscope and said, he will be a lawyer, then a city official, then a governor. But when this child died, the mother confronted the astrologer. He's dead, the one you said was going to be a lawyer and an official and a governor. By his holy memory, the astrologer replied, if he had lived, he would have been all those things. So I'll let you interpret what you will with what type of humor Cicero would describe that sort of joke. Now, if you're into classical literature and you've listened this far, you may have wondered, why am I just talking about one text of jokes when I'm missing out on an entire genre of literature that tackles the issue of humor. And that's true. There was an entire genre, and that would be comedy. Ancient Greek playwrights would write in one or two genres, tragedy or comedy. Comedy had a different meaning than how we would understand it today, so let me delve into it a little bit. For Greek playwrights, comedy really meant something, and it had a philosophical meaning behind it. Aristotle thought laughter was a distinctive trait of humanity, and one that distinguishes humanity from animals. Early treatises on medicine establish a relationship between laughter and good health. So something is humorous. It's good for the humors. Democritus thought that in his philosophy, one must opt for laughter in the face of the human condition. And this is where the Greeks thought that one of the great achievements of their civilization was the emergence and evolution of the theater. Alongside the genre of tragedy developed the comic theater. Classical tragedies dealt with kings and queens and extraordinary events and wars, but comedies were concerned with daily life and its preoccupations. It was a way to reflect the world and everyday life and the normal situations that people would go through. And comedy thrived on being prepared to laugh at the folly of others and to encourage the spectator to avoid ridiculous conduct in their own life. Satire was also used in Greek theater as a means of discrediting those in authority. Whether in the form of a poem or caricature in drama, its aim was to exaggerate the emotional and political and physical traits of opponents. Here's one joke about Emperor Augustus that comes long after his life, and it goes, 
Emperor Augustus toured his realm and came across a man who bore a striking resemblance to himself. You probably assume that with his tomcatting ways, this man's mother had worked her way into the royal palace and he had a liaison with her and thus produced this child. So he asked the man, was your mother at one time in service at the palace? And the man replied, no, your highness, but my father was. So that's a way to twist things on Augustus there. So those are some of the aspects of humor is used in the Greek and Roman worlds. Now I want to go back further here and look at the origins of humor. Now we're predating any written text here by thousands of years. So at this point we have to speculate. This isn't too dissimilar from about a year ago I did an episode on prostitution throughout history. And if you go back to the Code of Hammurabi, you'll see prostitution mentioned in the laws there. But since prostitution seems to be universal in every functioning society in history, we basically have to speculate, and that's what we have to do with humor. So in one article I came across called The First Joke, Exploring the Evolutionary Origins of Humor, what the authors speculate is that humor seems instinctive to humanity, so it could be reliant on genetic machinations. Humor is complex, and it depends on specific neural pathways and a high level of cognition. That's because when something is funny or not funny, it depends on nuanced verbal phrasing and an understanding of prevailing social dynamics. So that's why some of those Roman or Greek jokes don't work, because we don't know the social dynamics. And to anthropologist knowledge, there's no culture that exists that's unfamiliar with humor. So given that a simple joke can utilize language skills, theory of mind, symbolism, abstract thinking, social perception, it could be one of humanity's most complex cognitive attributes. Different AI software might be able to win at chess or the Chinese game of Go, but I'm not aware of software that can produce jokes. And again, our most ancient texts refer to joke makers. Ancient Greek texts contain descriptions of professional gestures, and there's also joke books. One date that an anthropologist put forward for the earliest emergence of humor was 35,000 years ago. This date was proposed by an anthropologist who came in contact with Australian aboriginals, and noted that they had humor in their tribe, and also that Australian aboriginals had been essentially genetically isolated for at least 35,000 years before British settlers appeared. So if genetic factors dictate the fundamental ability to perceive or produce humor, then 35,000 years may reflect a minimum age for humor in Homo sapiens. In this anthropology article, there are three theories of humor that are put forward. One is that humor reflects a set of incongruous conceptualizations. You're putting two things that don't go together together. Second, humor involves repressed sexual or aggressive feelings. There's a lot of scatological or sexual jokes all throughout history. And third, humor elevates social status by demonstrating superiority or saving face. So the first one, the incongruity theories of humor where you have one element that's socially normal, while the other one is a violation of subjective moral order. So one joke could be a child asks his mother, Mom, what does juvenile delinquency mean? And the mother responds, shut up and pass me the crowbar. And that's incongruous because a child is asking his mother an innocent question that the child presumably knows nothing about. And the mother responds in completely over-the-top, egregious behavior. So depending on your sense of humor, whatever that is, that could be funny. The other theory, and this sounds a lot more Freudian, is that humor and laughter originating in repressed expression of sexual or aggressive feelings. This falls within Sigmund Freud's psychological theory, where humor is a release of excessive sexual or aggressive tension. This is where we get the phrase Freudian slips from. This type of analysis of humor you would have seen all over the place, this psychoanalytical analysis especially if you were looking at a history book from the 50s or 60s. One of the big trends in history at this time was psychoanalyzing historical figures or using what they called psychobiography, where you would basically take a historical figure and put them on the psychiatrist or psychologist's couch and analyze them and use Freudian analysis and come up with theories that way. Some of this was good, but you also had some pretty weird theories too. Like, for example, there was a biography like this on Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, the founder of the Turkish nation. And the author proposed that the reason that Mustafa Kemal Ataturk wanted to change the Turkish alphabet from using Arabic characters in the language to Latin characters is because he never knew his father very well and had psychological angst against religion. 
That very well could be the case, but there are probably much better explanations for why Ataturk decided to do that. So that's some Freudian analysis of history. So the third use of humor is to demonstrate superiority and elevate social status. This is where you can have humor against politicians, against aristocrats, to insult people, to ridicule them, to put them down, a comedic roast. Thomas Hobbes and Leviathan clearly articulated this idea, and he characterized laughter as an extension of sudden glory. So those are different types of humor, but where could humor have come from and why did it appear? Well, to go back to our anthropologist, where they try to speculate on the origins of humor, there's no way to know when humor appeared relative to language, although it appears that sophisticated humor has to follow language. You need language to have humor. Some anthropologists put the origin of language between a few hundred thousand years ago to about two to four million years ago, with the increase of brain size among sapiens about two million years ago. There's evidence that a new level of symbolic thought was achieved about 50,000 years ago. One of the first evidences of symbolic art is a figurine integrating the head of a lion with the legs of a person that dates to about 32,000 years ago. So if you have symbolic thought, then your brain probably has a complex neural pathways that makes humor possible. One anthropologist, Dunbar, he put forth the theory that in primates, neocortical size is proportional to group size. And that language ultimately replaced grooming, where you imagine a bunch of chimps in a circle grooming each other. He said language replaced grooming as the primary social bond. So laughter could have been the affirming social bonding agent, which replaced grooming as what kept a tribe together. So if you look at it that way, humor and language could have been one of the very fundamental building blocks of not just civilization, but bonding among small clustered human groups. So those are some of the abstract approaches to the origins of humor. Let me just tag here by mentioning a collection of some jokes throughout history. I'll start with the Sumerians, I'll go through Egypt, mention a Roman joke, and then a medieval joke and a Renaissance one, and maybe there's an evolution, maybe there's a devolution, I'll let you decide. One of the oldest documented jokes we have comes from an ancient Sumerian clay tablet dating to 1900 BC, and it says, something which has never occurred since time immemorial. A young woman did not fart in her husband's lap. Well, I don't know what that can tell us about the Sumerian microbiome, but there you go. First recorded joke, everyone. An ancient Egyptian joke is, how do you entertain a bored pharaoh? Sail a boatload of young women dressed only in fishing nets down the Nile and urge the pharaoh to go fishing. I already mentioned the Anglo-Saxon joke about the key that hang around a man's thigh. Let me get into a medieval and renaissance joke, and this is where things get PG-13, everyone, so prepare yourself. Here's a medieval joke. A game of truth-telling is being played at the court by a queen and her retinue. A knight is asked by the queen if he has fathered any children. He is forced to admit that he has not. The queen nods in assent, saying, You do not have the look of a man who could please his mistress when you hold her naked in your arms. For your beard is little more than the kind of fuzz that ladies have in certain places, and it is easy to tell from the state of the hay whether the pitchfork is any good. On his turn, the knight asks, Lady, answer me without deceit. Is there a hair between your legs? When she replies, none at all, he comments, Indeed, I do believe you, for grass does not grow on a well-beaten path. There you are, everyone. If you're wishing for the good old days when people were more tasteful, those are the good old days. So that joke comes from A Distant Mirror, The Calamitous 14th Century, which is a great book about the Middle Ages. This last joke in the Renaissance comes from a joke book published in the 1400s by Poggio Bracciolini, and it goes like this, be forewarned. In Florence, a young woman, somewhat of a simpleton, was on the point of delivering a baby. She had long been enduring acute pain, and the midwife, candle in hand, inspected her secret area in order to ascertain if the child was coming. Look also on the other side, said the poor creature. My husband has sometimes taken that road. So there you are. You'll see highbrow, lowbrow, every type of humor across history. Now, what I'd like to do to wrap things up is look at the evolution of humor, how it comes to the United States, and how it comes into something we recognize more today. And I'm using the United States as the example because most of the audience is here in the United States, and I can speak on this topic better. But for listeners in England and elsewhere... Please feel free to respond on our Facebook group if you have insights on how the particular brand of humor in your country came into being. I'd be interested in hearing it. 
Now, in the early American colonies, humor was respected. Some may think of the United States in the 18th century 